Welcome everyone uh, to this Veritas Forum event. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to have uh, Marcus Yoko and Peter, Sp Peter Payne here uh, for this uh, interesting uh, lecture or whatever discussion we could call it. Uh, just uh, I'll tell you a few short words about what the Veritas Forum is all about, just to start off with. Uh, so the Veritas Forum is a, a non-profit organization or a network of sorts uh, arranging these kind of events where we go into looking at the big questions of life or, or the hard questions of life. Uh, we, we want to help uh, students, faculty members uh, to find a balanced position or, or to uh, understand the complexities of certain questions, such as the one that we're looking at today, the question of personality. Uh, what is a person really? So uh, generally, when we arrange a discussion like this one, we invite our speakers to share their worldview, uh, also how they look at uh, the world in, in a broader perspective than just uh, from the science that they have studied or, or that they represent in the discussion. Uh, which is something that generally in Finland is, is not that much talked about in the curriculum. So in that way, we, we just want to open up for that discussion uh, about uh, worldviews in general, uh, help people with questions like, so what is the meaning of life? Uh, what, what, why, why am I here? What am I here for? Uh, what, what is a person? Which is pretty much what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more about the Veritas Forum. Uh, we're going to have uh, a survey later, which uh, I'd be very happy if you could fill out uh, as you leave. And uh, there'll be more information about other things uh, pertaining to this event in, in a while. And they will just let you know that we really like discussions, so we're going to open for quite a lot of Q&A. And also after that, there will be coffee so that you can continue a proper discussion with a cup of coffee in your hand. Uh, uh, but that will be elsewhere and more information about that later. So for my part, welcome. And uh, I'll just hand over to whomever is going to speak next. Hi, greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm Rope Cohen, and I work from the Faculty of Theology, and I'll be the moderator for this debate. And can everyone hear me, maybe? OK, thank you. Well, what we are going to discuss here today is the question. Uh, please, could we focus on the topic at hand? But a personal matter, am I more than biology, is the question that we have convened here to discuss. It's a quite an interesting question. How should we form our view of what it means to be a human being? And uh, how, how should we formulate? What should we think about? What is human nature and so on? Is it, are we just biology, a collection of neurons maybe? Maybe we are our brains. Um, what are we? Do we have souls and so on? Big worldview questions. And usually uh, people from different traditions and sciences uh, can have different worldviews uh, about this issue and different methods of answering it. And often times it can be difficult uh, for us to get a proper discussion going between people who come from such different traditions. Uh, but here I think today we have quite some hope of getting uh, different views about this issue and different methods to actually discuss with one another because we have two very distinguished uh, scholars and gentlemen who have both uh, experience in this kind of discussion between uh, different disciplines and also even different worldviews. Uh, first, we have uh, Peter Payne uh, from the Institute of Credible Christianity in California, US. And we, he has uh, 20 years of experience in, in, from InterVarsity Fellowship work. And uh, if you're not familiar with the InterVarsity Fellowship, it's sort of like a, uh, like a Evangelical Church uh, Christian group for universities, so basically university ministry. But uh, in, in the later years, uh, Peter Payne has also traveled in, in Europe every year for about a month. And Peter has his degree, in, uh, his doctoral degree in philosophy, and has studied particularly the 
uh, existence of cosmic fine-tuning and the religious implications of that in that. But as I read through Peter's uh, discussions and his uh, CV, I was really impressed by the breadth of topics that he discusses in all these forums, like uh, uh, stuff ranging from all the, all the world religions, different philosophies and worldviews, and religion and science, and, and all sorts of stuff. So I'm really interested in hearing what he will have to say. Uh, then our, our other speaker is Dr. Professor, Associate Professor Markus Jokela, uh, who is, uh, actually has two doctoral degrees, one in psychology and one in epidemiology. But both of these are actually quite, uh, as I looked at the topics of your two doctoral dissertations, I was impressed that they actually are quite interdisciplinary because in, your, in his uh, psychological research, he looked at the effect of genes on psychology and then in his epidemic research, he looked at uh, mental disorders and obesity. So quite a sort of also psychological, biological factors involved in both of those. And he's also been quite active in popularization of science and generally in producing scientific publications and in interdisciplinary discussions. So it will be very interesting to hear also what he has to say. So the format of the discussion today is going to be as follows. First, we're going to be hearing 20-minute presentations from both of the speakers. And this will be followed by uh, 20 minutes of discussion between uh, the speakers. And after this, we will get to the uh, public question and answer time. So without uh, any further ado, I would like to welcome our, both of our speakers. And for you, also welcome both of our speakers. And first, Dr. Peter Payne, please. Well, thank you. It's fun to be here. This is my third time in Finland. I very much have enjoyed each of my times here. Uh, my background is in philosophy, and I'm very much interested in relationships of mind and brain. And if you know anything about philosophy, there's been a lot of discussion over the last century about how mind and brain work together. I think many people assume you have only two answers. One is that really we're just, we're just brains, and the mind is the brain. And the other assumption is, is, is a dualism, where you have uh, the person over here somehow influencing and manipulating the brain, but you have the, the non-material person manipulating the brain. Actually, not even Descartes held that view. He said that the relationship between the person and the, and the brain is not like the relationship of a captain on a ship. There's a much more integral relationship, so they actually overlap. So I think every time I have a thought, there are neural events taking place in my brain. So I don't think there are thoughts which take place and then I'm manipulating the neurons in my brain. But at the same time, I don't think that the self, the person, is simply equatable or identical with the, with, with, with the brain. So uh, a personal matter, am I more than biology? A quick summary of where I'm going. Most people, religious or not, hold a common set of beliefs about the nature of persons. Naturalism, interestingly enough, has difficulty with all these beliefs, and I'll clarify a bit what I mean about naturalism in just a moment. A couple of these beliefs in particular provide good reason for including that naturalism is not true. Most of my colleagues, most of my friends who are atheists assume that, of course, naturalism is true, and that becomes a major reason why they simply dismiss anything religious. Because after all, if we know that the physical world is all that exists and ultimately everything is physics, then to believe in anything which is non-physical, anything which is supernatural, is just you have to dismiss that. Okay, what is naturalism? A bit of clarification. Naturalism used to be called materialism. Philosophers oftentimes now use the word physicalism. And naturalism, as I'm using it, has two planks. One, the natural world is all that exists. So there's nothing supernatural. But second, the natural world is completely physical. So all this real consists of matter and energy in space and time. There are people who say the natural world is all this there, but there's a spiritual dimension to it, or there's a moral dimension to it, and you have non-material, non-physical aspects to the natural world. But when I talk, speak of naturalism, if you, if you prefer, think of materialism, where everything that is real is matter and energy in space and time. There is a book that came out in 2012 by a prominent atheist philosopher named Thomas Nagel. 
The title of the book was Mind and Cosmos, and the subtitle was the provocative thing. The subtitle was Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Conception of Nature is Almost Certainly False. Now, if you're an atheist, well, how can atheists be saying that naturalism is almost certainly false when most atheists think naturalism is almost certainly true? So for him to make a, write, write a book published by Oxford is claiming that what they think is obviously true is obviously false has created quite a bit of stir. I won't say a whole lot about Thomas Nagel, but I will give a couple of the arguments that he gives for why he thinks that naturalism is almost certainly false. Okay, then what is a person? I want to clarify that when I'm talking about person, we can think about a person as simply the physical being. In the U.S., you oftentimes have a sign on a room that says something like capacity 45 persons. That means 45 bodies. But also when we talk about person, we mean the inner person, the, the person that is me, the, the, the person that has feelings, perception, desires, thoughts. That's who I am as a person. Yes, there's, I, I'm also a physical body, but I'm this person and has the subjective awareness. So that's the inner person. And I also think of myself as being an agent someone who initiates actions uh, and decisions, and that that is what the person is. So the question is, what does one make of person in that sense? <laughs> now, the f I want to mention five beliefs about persons that I, that I said most people embrace. There are even a fair number of atheists who, em who embrace all five of these, although I think if one is a naturalist, one has a difficult time embracing all five of these, and a couple of them are, are really severely, uh, create severe difficulties for the naturalist. First, is the persons endure over time. Now, brains can endure over time, but part of what I mean by a persons endure over time is I believe that even though I'm radically different than when I was five years old, that was Peter Payne and this is Peter Payne, and there's still an identity between the two. Or when you enter, enter university, you're the same person when you leave university, even though there's lots of changes, it's still you. So there's an identity of person over time. But if, in fact, you think of the person simply being the physics, most of me when I was five years old is gone. Hardly any of that is part of me. Personality, memories, other things, there's only a small portion, which was true back then, which is also true today. Second, persons have conscious experiences. Well, of course persons have conscious experiences. But what does one make of that from a physiological standpoint? So you ask, what is the experience of pain? When I feel pain, is that simply pain behavior? or a disposition to say, ouch, or for, to, to contract my muscles? Or is it simply neurons firing in a particular way? What is the experience of pain? And from a standpoint of understanding what's going on in the brain, it simply doesn't fit in. So what are these experiences? Philosophers call them qualia, the experiences themselves. But we, most of us believe that we in fact do have experiences, and those experiences aren't just behaviors. Next, we believe that persons are causal agents. We think that persons actually cause things. If I raise my arm, I think I am the one who's raising my arm. It's not that my brain is causing me to think that I'm choosing to raise my arm, but that actually I am choosing to raise my arm. So there's a belief that I am the agent behind things that I do. More importantly, there's a question, is this subjective, this person, this person that I sense to be, does this person have any influence at all on the course of my life, on the course of my body? If the person doesn't have any causal influence whatsoever, then as much as I may think that I am directing the course of my life or influencing it, in fact, that's not the case. And many people who are naturalists say the, the person is actually carried along by the physics. And you may feel yourself to be free, and you may feel yourself to be the causal agent, but really all the causal work is done by the physics of your brain. And you as a person, the experiential side of it, really doesn't do anything. Next is the notion the person's bear responsibility. That's the notion that when you do something, you can be held responsible for it. If a person absolutely could not do anything different, you knew exactly what a person's brain was like, and you know the physics dictated the person did something, you would typically say, well, you can't hold the person responsible unless the person earlier on was responsible for something that got them into that position. But if you keep going back and each step, this state was, was, was due to the state before, the state before, and the person never really has any causal influence, it's all determined by prior states, then in fact, where does responsibility come in? And we have this notion that the person is dictated by the physical states of their brain to do things, they, we can treat them as a doctor, 
but they can't really hold them as being responsible, but most people, people believe that persons do bear responsibility. A fifth point is that persons are great and roughly equal worth. Uh, that's something which, <clears throat> let's skip down here a few things, a few slides. From a Christian perspective, uh, from a Christian perspective, we're creating the image of God. The reason we have worth is that all of us are, are, are deemed wor have, have worth before God. And if you think of the uh, love your neighbor as yourself, the two great commands, love God, love your neighbor as yourself, well, why would you say love your neighbor as yourself? It's because your neighbor is worth as much as you are. If you think your neighbor is worth less than you, then there's no obligation to love your neighbor as yourself. You might out of prudence say, well, I need to be nice because I want him to be nice to me. But the principle of love your neighbors yourself, really uh, uh, behind that is the idea that my neighbor is as much worth as I am. Within the secular world, there's a similar idea. In fact, not all uh, secular people are utilitarians, but utilitarian is a common view of ethics amongst uh, atheists. And utilitarianism basically says that the right thing to do is what will maximize the greatest happiness to the greatest number of people. But if you reflect for a moment, <clears throat> there's the assumption that each person's happiness counts the same. So you don't say, here's a person with a PhD, we'll count his or her happiness as five times what the janitor's happiness is worth. So you talk about maximizing happiness, you don't give some people's happiness as way much more. You say that every person's happiness counts the same, but basically that's the notion that every person's worth is the same. So even from a secular standpoint, a secular ethics, there's this notion that people have great and roughly equal worth. But from the perspective of naturalism, values don't actually exist. The only things that exist are physical entities. So the only reality that values have are what people actually value. That doesn't mean they're arbitrary. Uh, people obviously value food, and it's natural that people value food, so it's not just I happen to value food. So in that sense, there's some objective reality behind it. I need food, and I will be happier if I have food. But at the same time, value itself simply reflects what I value. And where values differ amongst people, there's no way from a naturalist standpoint to say, you're right and you're wrong. Even something as, uh, as basic as parents love their children. We're wired to love our children. But there's a certain percentage of parents that for some reason don't love their children. Suppose you have this 1% of uh, people who don't love their children. How can you say, well, the 99% are right and the 1% are wrong? Rather, they're simply the vast majority. You can't say the 1% are wrong, what they happen to value something differently. So from the naturalist standpoint, the idea that everyone's of equal worth has to be something you simply buy into. But why should I buy into that from a naturalist perspective? You could choose to do so. But let me suggest that actually the equal ver, this great worth of equal every individual, is deeply rooted in the Judeo-Christian perspective. If you look outside of that in other cultures, that is not a common value. There are individuals who hold to it. You can find Buddhists and others who will hold to something like the golden rule, and I think there's, that's attractive to us. But there's not something in human nature that says human beings will always be drawn to this, or that people will typically think of others as being of equal worth. If you take all the above beliefs, all of them have are problems for, for naturalists. The people endure over time, even the concept of persons. When I am making a choice about what I'll have for lunch, there's a part of my brain that's involved in that, and I decide I'll have a ham sandwich or a beef sandwich. When I am working on a math problem, another part of my brain comes out with a particular solution. Well, is there some common center of the brain, which is now taking the math problem, is now doing the food problem, and the same part of the brain is coming out with the solutions, or is that some part of the brains pop out with this answer, another part pop out this answer, is there any common center behind them? Or even when you're torn between two things, your desire says, oh, I really want to do this, but your moral sense says, no, I shouldn't do it. Your moral sense is located in your frontal lobe, and your frontal lobe is saying, no, don't do it, but your desires are saying, do it. Is there any part of your brain sort of getting this input and that put in, okay, what will I do? I mean, think of it that way. And will I then choose to go with the frontal lobe or will I choose to go with my desires? There's nothing in neurology that says there's any central place which is adjudicating between these different desires and say, this is what I'm gonna do. So rather one is stronger than the other, the one which is stronger is the one that wins out. So is there a person which unifies the brain or is the brain just simply pops out and the only unity we have 
is the unity of this flow of conscious experience. But typically we think the person is something though actually directing it. It's not just simply the unity of conscious experience. The whole concept of person just doesn't fit in within a science, a scientific description or a naturalistic description. So what does one make of that? Let me suggest that from a naturalistic standpoint, uh, if all there is is matter and energy and space-time, then mental states, persons, feelings, ideas, and values must either not exist at all, we're simply mistaken in thinking they exist, or if they think there really are such a, there is such a thing as the feeling of pain, then it must be the feeling of pain actually is a physical state. Because after all, physical states are the only things that are real. Now, there are some naturalists who would say there are no such things as, phys as experiences at all. They're a limited materialist. But others say, no, there really are. But these subjective experiences, if we analyze and understand it right, really are just physical events. So it's mind, body, identity theories, and philosophers have been working on this for, for, for a long time. So if we look at these two options, the first one, uh, mental states don't exist, is sometimes referred to as folk psychology. We think that what I do is, is, is brought about by my desires, but really desires have nothing to do with it. Whereas most people want to say, no, actually there is a connection and desires ha must be having some causal work, but have causal work, the desire must actually be a physical state within the brain. So the other option is to say that, me that mental states do exist, but they're actually physical. So if you understand it correctly, what you thought was something non-physical actually ends up being physical. Amongst the people who hold this view, there are those who think that the mental states are reducible down to the physical states and those who think they're not reducible to physical states. Daniel Dennett is a good example of a person who is a reductive naturalist. So if you ask, what is pain? His solution is that pain really is an input-output relationship. It's really the behavioral response that we give to certain inputs, and that is really all there is to pain. Is there such a thing as the experience of pain? Well, yes it is, but actually all that is is behavior. Is there something which is the feel of pain which is distinct from the behavior. Daniel Dennis says, we're inclined to think there is, but there actually isn't. So in his view, actually, there are no conscious experiences. If we think about it hard enough, we'll see the conscious experiences actually are uh, brain states or they are behavioral states. Now, there are a fair number of, of naturalists. Oh, by the way, the problem with, with that particular approach is that almost invariably when people say the mental state really is a physical state and you have their proposal, what gets left out of their proposal is the feel of it. There's no experience. So when you say, well, the feeling of pain really is the behavior, you notice that what you're left with the behavior is nowhere in the picture is their experience of pain. Whereas you expect, you say, you would expect that if you could show that the feeling of pain is in fact the physical state, once the explanation is given, you say, ah, I see here. Yes, in fact, they're connected with each other. They are the same. But what happens is they say, this really is that. But when you look at it, the first part disappeared. So it really ends up being denial that there are mental states at all. And that's the difficulty of trying to say the mental states really are just the physical states. But then you are, there are non-reductive materialists. And I don't percentage-wise how this works out. But there's people like John Searle, another atheist, who believes that mental states are high-level emergent properties of purely physical systems. So there's nothing really non-physical happening, but at the same time he says the experience you have of pain cannot be reduced down to behavior or neurons. It's just that when you get neurons arranged in a certain kind of way and functioning a certain kind of way, well, this property emerges of feelings, and you have these feelings which emerge. And so in, in his case, he says, well, obviously they do exist, but they're not really something non-physical. They're odd and they don't appear to be physical, but nonetheless, they're physical properties and they're the properties of physical systems. They're simply high-level properties of it. A problem with that is that all other high-level properties of physical systems seem explicable in terms of the nature of the parts and their interactions. So what about DNA encoding? Surely the capacity of DNA to code for the building, uh, building of a human being is a high-level property. Yes, it is and you don't have it by looking at the individual parts, you only see it when you look at the, the, as a whole what it's doing. But at the same time, when you look at it as a whole what it's doing, even though it's very, very complicated, you're not saying, say, well, where, how, how do we get the coding? You, you look at it and you say, yes, in fact, it does make sense. The high-level property is something that makes perfectly good sense given the physical states. But when you look at pain, 
even if you knew exactly what's going on in the brain when you feel pain, we'd say, oh, of course there's pain. You put the wires together like this and you'll feel pain. Some of you may be familiar with Alan Turing. The, the Turing test is that if you have some uh, person or maybe a robot on the other side of a wall, and Alan Turing said, if you, can, if you cannot determine whether it's a robot or whether it's a person by asking questions, then by definition, whatever it is has conscious experiences. So in Alan Turing, the experience is just the function. But is the experience really just the function? Uh, most people say, no it's, it, no, no, it's not. A second problem is how can emergent properties in a physical system have any causal effect on the system? So if you have some, uh, amazingly, you have an experience of pain, does the experience of pain have any effect on the system as a whole? All the causal powers seem to lie within the physical constituents of their arrangement. A second problem is that when we look at animals, all the higher phyla, it seems though all of them have experiences, they all have sentience. But if there's no causal power to any of the sentience, then why do they have it? And uh, 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 Thomas Nagel argues, surely there's some causal role. The fact that I feel pain has some causal role. That the fact that I have conscious thoughts has some causal role in the history of the human race. It's not just this byproduct. But from, from John Searle's position, it seems as though you have something emerging, but it doesn't have any causal power because there's no substance to it. The only substance to it is, lies within uh, physics. Okay, so conclusion. Um, naturalism uh, is, uh, surely naturalism is false, not that, it's, not that it doesn't say a lot of true things, but at least it seems to be incomplete. Naturalism doesn't seem to be capable of being able to account for mental experience. If you think that's part of the real, then it's missing something which is, which is, which is the case. Uh, I'll come back to Thomas Nagel. Uh, what's missing? Missing are, are the mental states. What is one, how does one account for that? One can either account for that by saying, well, the natural world simply has the mental built into it. You have to have a new, new metaphysics and you build the mental into it. The other way is to say, no, there's something like mind behind it, the theistic proposal. In our interaction, I may come back to say a little bit why I think that the naturalistic approach doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And the one at least ought to take seriously, if one takes mind seriously and experiential property seriously, the idea that there's something like mind behind the universe and that has an impact on religious questions. It doesn't, doesn't make a person become a Christian, but if in fact there's something like mind behind the universe that makes it much more plausible that something like the Christian faith is true than if you think that the, the grounding of everything is simply uh, uh, physics that has nothing like mind in it at all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so my background is in, uh, actually my background goes way back uh, to the ones that you, you presented. Uh, I started in, actually in law school, but I won't go into details in that aspect. So I, I went to study sociology and science studies and philosophy of science and kind of accidentally uh, wandered to the fields of psychology, genetics and, and public health. And I, I assume that some of my, uh, one of the reasons why I happen to be invited uh, to discuss these matters is that I've been go, uh, going through different di disciplines and actually I think that the, the faculty of theology is the only faculty in Helsinki that I haven't taken any courses in. <laughs> so I've been, I've been <laughs> going around in, in different uh, disciplines. So, but my, my views on, on the topic are kind of really practical and uh, because I'm, uh, my, my views on the issues of human nature derive from empirical sciences rather than uh, kind of more general uh, philosophical ideas. So actually, I, I have to admit as a disclaimer already from the beginning that probably kind of philosophically considered uh, many of my views are simple-minded, but I take comfort in that uh, kind of simple-mindedness because I, I think in the end, um, science, even though the inner workings of science and the, the things that go on behind the scenes in science are really complex and difficult, but when it comes to presenting the, the ideas or the arguments about 
what do you mean by that and how do you define that, how you measure things, uh, then I think uh, simple-mindedness, <laughs> maybe that's not the best word, but simple-mindedness is, is, uh, is a virtue of, of science and empirical science. So I'd like to start my, my I was asked to give a kind of more uh, sort of scientific perspective of, from personality psychology and, and psychology in general. And uh, my perspective starts with a, one, one, uh, one of my favorite quotes from a psychologist, which is from Edward Thorndike, who said that if something exists, it has to exist uh, in some amount. And if something exists in some amount, you can measure it. And so that's pretty simple. So, so the way I, I start thinking about these issues is always, how do you measure it? And I think most scientific endeavors start with the, with a question, not necessarily about the question of whether it exists or how it exists and so on, but how you can measure it and whether you can measure it. And that already defines, for the simple-minded people like me, it defines kind of the, the borders where you, can, where you can argue scientifically and where the, maybe the border between sci empirical science and philosophy lies. So usually philosophy is more about things that you can't measure and uh, empirical science, by definition, has to be something that you can, uh, you can measure. So I've been studying personality psychology uh, and uh, public health and psychiatric epidemiology and so on, and I've been studying these at, at different levels. So I've been looking at molecular genetics of, of depression, gene in, environment interactions, and uh, but I've also studied public health and epidemiology of topics related to population level outcomes. From, from my perspective, the different perspectives on mind or brain or, or human behavior are related to not levels of existence, so at what level things exist, but levels of exp explanation. So you have different levels of explanation for people's behavior, or their uh, personality traits, or, or their preferences, or goals, or whatever. So you can analyze genes, you can analyze hormonal activity, you can analyze brain, brain activity, and uh, different kinds of topics. But the issue is not whether these different levels uh, exist or don't exist, but how, at what level you want to explain these things. So it's about aggregation. This morning uh, there was a um, major traffic jam in, in Helsinki because the trains weren't uh, running properly. And uh, I was wondering about the traffic jam, how you would go on explaining traffic jams. Well, you could start with really small minor movements of people's hands and feet and toes and, and fingers, and you could start building the model of traffic jams by how people steer their vehicles and how, how they press the accelerator and so on. But obviously that's not the, the level that you want to put the explanation. Uh, that would be the most intuitive one. That would be a very, very laborious one and, and probably not that uh, valuable. So you might then aggregate the, the explanation at the level of traffic flows. You just count the number of vehicles, you count the uh, how, how fast the vehicles are going, and then you can come up with a good model and a good explanation for the uh, development of, of traffic jams. But in the end, you, you could argue, and I would argue, that you can go then, in principle, you could go at the level of hand movements and, and single uh, nerve cells firing in, in different patterns, uh, and you could expl explain the, the whole traffic jam phenomena in that way. But, well, we have, have uh, nowhere near the knowledge that we could do so, but in principle it would be uh, feasible. So that's my, my view on the idea of, I wouldn't call it emergence, I, would, uh, I wouldn't say that the traffic jam is an emergent property of the individuals or the, even the vehicles, it's just that we describe the topic on a different level, uh, on different levels. Now, th this comes to uh, 
This leads us to another topic, which is probably more related, again, not the, what sort of things there exist in the world, but how usually scientific disciplines are much better at building fences rather than bridges. So you have almost at the border of almost any scientific discipline, you have the kind of issue about, well, biology, it, you can't reduce it to uh, chemistry or physics or psychology, you can't reduce it to uh, physics and, and biology or, or social, one of the uh, Within social sciences, one of the major divisions is, is in, in, within the social sciences, the idea of Emil Durkheim and, and some of the uh, si similar-minded people who suggested that social facts exist in, in the world independently of the individual psychology behind them. So you, when you are explaining social phenomena, you want to explain them by other social phenomena, and it's kind of an anathema to explain them with individual psychology. And I think that this is, reflects more the unfortunate uh, situation of, of scientific disciplines, that you kind of always want to be autonomous and you want to protect your own explanations from, from other disciplines. Uh, and that's why usually the reductionist uh, argument or the uh, saying that something is reductionist is, is considered uh, something that you, want to, you don't want to be called. Now, when you are making arguments that something emerges, something uh, that's not reducible to the individual parts of the, of the lower level structures, I'm always reminded by the, the idea of phlogiston. So in the 17th century, uh, there was this idea that things that burn, they con contain phlogiston, which is, was supposed to be some sort of an element that explains why some things burn and why some things don't burn. And always when, when people are putting forth the idea that, well, you can't explain, we, or we can't explain at the moment, we can't explain how some things work, and then we come up with, well, maybe there's this separate level of being uh, or separate element that accounts for the, our inability to explain this phenomenon. I'm always reminded by the phlogiston idea. Well, nowadays, obviously, we don't believe that things that burn uh, contain phlogiston. We know that there's no such thing as phlogiston. But again, when, when we, we don't know how the brain gives rise to the mind, and we have difficulties in explaining the mind at the level of neural activity, well, maybe it just reflects our uh, inability to explain the thing, but it doesn't mean that we would want to postulate some uh, other elements or levels of being similar to phlogiston. So we are getting there, I, I think, uh, in, in science. Uh, so, so we no need to uh, make those kinds of adjustments in the meantime. The other nice quote that I like uh, related to science is, why think, why not do the experiment? So, Usually when I, I'm, people ask me questions about uh, human behavior and, and, uh, and or social sciences or health and, and so on, the first question is, how do you measure it? And then the second question is, well, how would you go on to experiment and test the, the ideas that you put forth? And, uh, well, the, the problem of conscien consciousness and uh, mental states is obviously a, um, a really a difficult one, but I, I haven't read the book by uh, Nagel. I, I, I just read some reviews on the book and then the short piece he, he wrote in the New York Times. And I have major difficulties in imagining how you would go on to try to prove or disprove the idea that you, the mental states are somehow separate from the, from the uh, physical uh, structures that they, they are based on. So if you consider, say, altered states of consciousness, for me, the, the uh, a demonstration that you can alter your consciousness by, let's say, a person drinks a bottle of whiskey, his or her consciousness and the experiences that the person has will radically change. 
from the time before the person drank the bottle of whiskey. So you, if you can experiment, then you can, you can causally affect the, the, uh, the experiences of the person and the feelings and, and so forth by manipulating just the physical structures of, of the brain. Well, that goes to show, I, I think, that they are, in fact, the same. I, I know that this logic probably might not hold water uh, in a more kind of philosophical way, but again, simple-minded folks uh, like me would consider that sort of like, well, that's, I, for me, that's, that seems to be at least some proof for, for my position. What would be the, the counter-argument for, for that position? <coughs> Now, a lot of the human problems and uh, ingenuity uh, as well arise from people being self-aware. So I, I would prefer, again, because I'm inclined to liking concepts that can be measured, I, I rarely use the concept of consciousness, but rather people are self-aware and uh, people have intentions. So we are intentional uh, individuals. Now, self-awareness, obviously is one of the big uh, unanswered questions in uh, psychology. How can we can be self-aware of ourselves? So we can think our thoughts and uh, we can plan ahead and uh, we can manipulate our, our, our thoughts. As you, as you mentioned, you can kind of reflect on your, uh, on your thoughts. From from an evolutionary perspective, I think the self, if you consider self-awareness rather than consciousness or the feelings that you, you have, uh, make evolutionary sense. People are able to plan ahead further and they don't have to be living in the specific moment and be uh, just the kind of recipient of the uh, environmental responses or, or circumstances that they are living in but rather they, they can imagine themselves in some other situations in the future, and therefore the, the self-awareness of, of individuals gives the survival advantage, if you will, uh, to, to plan ahead and therefore uh, make better judgments. But again, if, if you consider the kind of scientific explanation uh, uh, idea of relating the fact that we are agent, we have agency and we have intentions and we can make decisions, then I, I think from an empirical point of view, again, it's not that whether we do or we don't have these uh, capabilities, but rather I think it's, it's a question of degree of having this uh, kind of free agency. So if each individual was completely free agent, capable of making decisions in, in one direction or the other, well, it would be really difficult for the human sciences or behavioral sciences, social sciences, to make any models that would predict people's behavior. So a lot of the things that we are, when we are studying people's behavior, is based on the fact that, well, people don't behave in, in a way that they would have completely free agency, but rather they are behaving based on their cognitive biases, their um, biological preferences, uh, their following, their following social norms, and so forth. So, so actually, it's, you, you could argue that, well, we, we don't build the, um, not, not every, all the behaviors that people uh, show are based on their kind of free choices, rather we are behaving in a predictable manner uh, uh, in, in many, many situations. So, I think a lot of these kind of, uh, many of the questions are, uh, you can go back to the fact that we don't understand, that's clear, that we don't understand all the uh, details, how the biology gives rise to the mind and uh, all the details. We know a lot of those things. Uh, so, let's say genetic, Molecular genetics has been, uh, the development in molecular genetics has been really slow. So many, maybe 20 years ago, people said that, well, we'll have the uh, genetics of personality and intelligence and, uh, and you know, uh, preferences and so on covered, uh, 
we have the data and the information on that within 10 years. Well, we, we haven't. We're, the, the genetic molecular genetics of behavior uh, has been pretty slow uh, to progress. And, uh, and uh, we know, say, human height has been studied a lot. And we only can explain 20% of human height, which is easily measured uh, by the genetics. But you can trust that the, the progress will, will go on. And in the meantime, I, I wouldn't recommend to you to uh, kind of base the, the, the uh, arguments or the assumptions of how the brain and mind would, would be separable uh, based on the fact that, well, we can't explain something or it's really difficult to explain. So for me, I don't understand cargo ships, large ships that float on, on water. For me, it's completely difficult to explain. It's like people can explain, well, yeah, there's the physics behind it and so on. But for me, it's, it's still like, well, how can a piece of metal float on a, on a water? But I wouldn't go on then saying that, well, because I, I, I have difficult, difficulties in understanding it, I wouldn't go on and, and say that, well, there has to be something uh, kind of beyond that or beyond physics. So I, that's just my, my limitation uh, of of, the, of understanding these kind of physical uh, uh, facts. Yeah, and that's about it. Okay, thank you. So now we're going to have both speakers up front, and we're going to have about 20 minutes of dialogue. Peter can begin with a question or remark in response. Yeah, so we, we started off thinking we have 10 minutes apiece, but if you do that, it's hard to remember all the things the person said. And I decided it'd be better to just have some, some give and take uh, back and forth. Uh, so the first thing I'll, I'll start off by saying, it, it is, it's nice when things are measurable. But to say something doesn't exist, or presume it doesn't exist, uh, or that whatever exists will be measurable, that's an assumption. Uh, an article that Thomas Nagel wrote was entitled, What is it like to be a bat? You know, a bat that flies around in caves. The reason he, he gave that illustration was that he presumes that it is something to be a bat. If you ask, what is it like to be a stone? There's not anything like to be a stone. A stone doesn't have any experiences at all. But presumably, when a bat is flying around a cave, it has something kind of analogous to visual experience. It has some awareness of the cave. But he used that example because it's not really visual perception. It makes these sounds, they bounce off the walls, and they have an awareness of their environment through a different sense than what we have. So if you presume that there really is something that's like to be a bat, he had, then asked the question, suppose you knew every physical fact about the bat, how its brain works, how the sound waves work, how that gets transmitted, how that gets processed, the information processing, how it's able to avoid flying in other bats. Suppose you could explain all the behavior of a bat and all the neurology of a bat. Would you know what it's like to be a bat? Now, there are some atheists who would say, actually, you would, because what it's like to be a bat really is just this high-level behavior of being able to avoid flying into each other. But I think most people say, no, being, being, avoiding flying into each other isn't the same thing what it's like to be a bat. Most people presume there really is some experience of what it's like to be a bat. Well, is there any way of being able to measure what it's like to be a bat? I would say, no, there is no way of being able to measure what it's like to be a bat. And simply because you can't measure it doesn't mean that it's not a fact. Another way of looking at it, if you know all the physical facts, but there is a fact about what it's like to be a bat, that means there are facts which are not physical facts. And the naturalist typically says all facts ultimately are physical facts. So somehow this fact of what it's like to be a bat has to be explained in terms of the physical facts that you know. So then you would know what it's like to be a bat because after all that has to be one of the physical facts. So the question, what does one make of this? And the question isn't looking at a brain. Obviously, a brain does have all these neural processes going on. But when we think it's just the physics, what does one make of the fact that a bat does have experience, that we have experiences, if they're not reducible down to something else? 
uh, then what do we make of that? And the contention that Thomas Nagel makes, and that I think makes sense, is that it's, that it's not the case that everything is simply measurable and everything is physics, even though that doesn't mean there's something beyond, beside that. If you look at a brain and ask what's going on in a brain, Thomas Nagel would say there's not the mind out there somewhere else. You look, you'll find the mind somewhere. But he's saying our understanding what constitutes this natural structure of the brain isn't just the physics that we think of it. Somehow, if this brain is conscious, then there has to be something different about the metaphysics, the reality of the brain itself that we're missing. <coughs> and if we're missing that, then naturalism is missing something significant. Okay, Marcus, what is it like to be a bat? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, then your own question or comment. Back. <clears throat> yeah, if there's any members of the Finnish Academy, uh, just remind, remember that there might be some uh, grant applications to be filled in empirical study of what is, it, what is it like to be a bat? Um, well, I, I, I think the, the same applies. You mentioned that the, the, it's an assumption that anything that exists can be measured. Uh, yes, it is an uh, assumption. And it's, I think it's an assumption that you, if you want to do empirical science, that's an, a reasonable uh, assumption to make. So, so you start off with that assumption. But again, I, I think the same applies to the, the issue with the bat. So, Usually the arguments with that, if you knew all the physical components and the details and, and all the uh, uh, neural uh, factors and so on, would you know what is it like to be a bat? Well, we have no answer for that because that's, that's assuming that if we had all the data, would we know? Well, we don't have all the data. And that's why we, we that it's an assumption that, well, most people would consider that, well, it wouldn't still explain all the, all the things, what is it like to be a bat. But we have no way of knowing, because we, we haven't got all the data. So if we had all the data, maybe it would turn out that, well, actually, now I know what is it like to be a bat. So, so and that would be my assumption, that, well, if you know, if you take all the individual parts and you could uh, describe all those individual parts, you would actually know. And that's why I, I kind of, because I, I think the traffic jam example is closer to something that we can actually measure, and we could uh, go at least at the level of individual fingers and individual behaviors, maybe some, some rudimentary uh, physiological measurements, and we would then measure all those things, and then we'd explain the, the traffic jam flo uh, or traffic flows. I think that at least that example makes sort of more intuitive sense or you can at least think about it in a way that, well, would you be able to explain the traffic jam with the level of individual movements of fingers and feet? Well, I, I think you could. So, well, the, the same logic, I think, applies that it's, a, it's an assumption and it's kind of a, a sort of a belief that whether the, the feeling of being something would be understood at the uh, kind of physical level, if you will, uh, then yes, I, I think that would be that would make make sense. But uh, basing basing the I, I think this is basing the, the the argument on the kind of individuals' feelings of of or ideas that well, I think it wouldn't I, I wouldn't know yet what is it like to be a bat, but we know only when we have the data. What what makes it different? The, the mental states, is that when you ask, what will we discover when we discover what lies behind experiences? So I think we may well discover at some point in studying the brain that when this particular situation is taking the place in the brain, or this particular neural system is working, every time you have that, the person will have conscious experiences. Or you might even get so far as to be able to say, when this is happening in the brain, you have experience of red. Or when this is happening, you have an experience of blue. Or when this is happening, you have an experience of joy. Even if you could take exactly what's happening within the brain, unlike the other examples like the traffic jam, where, of course, all the parts do explain. There's nothing mysterious about it. Even if you knew exactly what's going on in the brain when conscious states are present, why would it be present? So for instance, it's been suggested that one, one of the things which is uh, explaining consciousness is consciousness is when a system is monitoring itself. So the subject is never aware of itself, it's always aware of something that it's monitoring. 
So the brain has this self-monitoring, and perhaps that level of self-monitoring, that's where awareness comes out. But if that were the case, if that were a sufficient explanation, then a thermostat on the wall would be conscious. Because after all, it's a system that's monitoring itself. It has a metal coil or, or a, a tube, and it's measuring itself. But do we really think that a thermostat is conscious? So it's, the question is, even if we knew exactly what's taking place, and when we, when, we, when we imagine what that would be like, coming up with it, no matter what we imagine it being, and we don't know what it would be, it doesn't seem as though the answer would be solved. Whereas everything else, you know, why is it that a bumblebee flies? You know, I don't know, how, how could a bumblebee fly? Well, assume, presumably, once you do the calculation, the physics, you won't say, oh, well, it's still a mystery why a bumblebee flies. But once you figure that out, there's no longer a mystery. And the question is, once you figure out all the, all the neural connections, would you, in fact, uh, have an explanation for why it's there? You have people like Daniel Dennett who would say, you would have an explanation because there really is no experience. It really is just the behavior. And by the way, Daniel Dennett doesn't think the experience is the neural connections because your neural connections are different. One person can feel pain, another person can feel pain, but there's different things going on in their brains. So he thinks the feeling of pain is actually the behavior, the input output relationships, the relationship between the things that happen to you and the ways in which you behave. He thinks that is the pain. Now, some people would say, okay, that is the pain, but that really means there really is no such thing as the experience itself, whereas you get people like John Searle say, no, there really is something distinctively different. And an emergent, it could be an emergent, he, he, well, your position is not an emergent one, because in the traffic jam example, there's nothing new which is emerging, it's a higher level. But when it comes to mental ex experiences, he thinks you just have a brain working in this way, and suddenly you have experiences that aren't reducible down just to the physics. But if so, then how can they have any causal influence? And if you think that conscious states have had no causal influence on human history, that's an opposition hold. So, so would you consider that it would be possible to have, or would it be somehow possible to have the exact same neural pattern or the activity without having, for some individuals, without having the, the feeling that most people would have related to the neural pattern? Yeah, I, suspect, yeah, I suspect the answer to that is no. If somehow we had engineering capacities to be able to construct a brain with the same materials and put it together and get it functioning, would it have conscious experiences? I think it probably would. Now, it varies. I mean, it depends on what's the relationship between uh, are human beings, uh, is, there, is there a part of human beings which isn't physical? I think there actually is. But at the same time, I think all the uh, thoughts that I have are dependent upon my brain. And if you were able to create a being that was the same, would it have conscious experience? I, I think it probably would. Yeah. But the question is then, what does that tell us about this brain itself that has conscious experiences? Does that tell us that the material world or the natural world really isn't just the physics like the, the we presume? We presume that everything is a, we're complex biochemical machines. But in fact, even within physics, we're not mechanical. There's very counterintuitive things. So when it comes to how we think about the brain, if in fact whatever it is is such that we do have conscious experiences, we have to think about, rethink what it is. Thomas Nagel's suggestion is let's not bring God into the picture, but let's just say whether well, there's something about the natural world that has this uh, explanatory component to it which isn't just the physics. So he talks about a natural teleology. I tend to think that any sort of teleology is aiming towards things, is aiming towards something that has to have the minimum characteristics of personhood. But when I look at the natural world, apart from biological creatures that have intentions, I don't see any sort of uh, larger structures that have intentions. So unlike pantheism that says the universe as a whole is like a mind, I look at the structure of the cosmos, I don't see it functioning like a mind. But if in fact there's some explanation for why there's mind in the universe, I think a good explanation for is there's something actually behind the universe. Now, it is kind of like phlogiston. At this point, I am positing something that we don't know. But when it comes, is there such a thing as conscious experience when a person says, well, that's just like phlogiston, I would say, no, phlogiston was a, was a construct to try to explain something. Whereas I think my feeling pain isn't just something which I've constructed. I mean, it's just a human construction that doesn't really exist. The people who say it's folk psychology would say it's just phlogiston. But the others would say, no, it's actually there, but it has to be just physical. <laughs> I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> sort of, uh, that I, I, 
Yeah, I didn't mention it. But by the way, that we're, we're deeply affected by our brains. And if you study psychology, uh, there was a, a case of a uh, high school teacher in Virginia, I think it was back in the 1970s or 80s, who started exhibiting this really uh, uh, bad uh, sexual behavior towards other women. He got consumed with pornography. And when he started be sexually uh, uh, attacking or uh, going after his daughter, the, the wife called the police. And so he's hauled into, into jail. But before they did anything with him, they sent him off to a doctor. Well, it turns out there was this growth on his frontal lobe. They removed the growth on the frontal lobe, and his behavior went right back to normal. <laughs> okay? What, what was happening? Was he just a perverse, uh, immoral person, or is the frontal lobe, the, this growth on the frontal lobe, making him do it? Now, it clearly it had a strong influence. That doesn't mean he doesn't, didn't have any control whatsoever, but clearly the things that we do are deeply controlled by things that go on in our brain. There's a story of the, the railway worker back in the 19th century, and a spike went up through his jaw and up through the top of his head, but he didn't keel over dead. In fact, there's pictures of the spike and him standing next to it, and a picture of a skull afterwards with a hole in it. And, but the, what happened was he lost all moral sense. His frontal lobe was destroyed, and all your moral sense in the frontal lobe, and he just didn't care what people thought about him. He'd walk around naked. He would just, just had no, no social sense whatsoever. Uh, you know, what happened to him? So clearly, we're not independent of our brains. And oftentimes, people say, well, surely we must just be our brains if we're not independent of it. But I would suggest that no, there could be the, the fact that, it's, that, that persons and, and sensations and experiences aren't reducible down to it. We need to rethink the basic metaphysics, which I think is undercut the assumption of naturalism that says everything is just physics. Yeah, so, so but actually the, the, uh, the case of, of, of the brain damage cases, would you consider that the, uh, now I lost his name, the famous spike through the head, Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage. Yeah. Phineas Gage. Uh, yes. So, I, I guess in this, this would be an example that where the physical structure of the brain gets damaged. His feelings are also kind of conscious feelings of, let's say, shame and uh, responsibility or and uh, regret and so on All are diminished school. and right. are kind of gone. Right. So that would suggest that you 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 can. Uh, well, you're going to ask, is he, is he the same person? I mean, that's a radical case of transformation. Well, I would say that he's the same person, even though it's a radical case of transformation, to take the person who has Alzheimer's, who has very little memory left. Is that the same person? Uh, if in terms of uh, abilities and capacities, no, it's not the same person. But if it's not the same person, why don't you just eliminate it? Why, why should children care for this if it's not the same person? And sort of the question, is there any identity over time, and is our identity completely dependent upon our capacities? And if I'm incapacitated, am I no longer, uh, no, is, 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 is there no longer the person there? And I believe that, in fact, there is a sense of personhood which is independent of uh, my capacities and independent of the, the physical things I am able to do, even though I cannot have thoughts mm -hmm. apart from my brain functioning in certain ways, and I can't have even moral thoughts but I think for Phineas Gage, how does God view him? I don't think God condemns him for doing immoral things after his frontal lobe was this, this, this destroyed, because he has no way of being able to act in a moral way. So God's not going to condemn him for that. But that's a, that's a different question. Maybe it's time for the moderator to use his power and ask a, ask a few questions. I, I will do so. Uh, first to Marcus. Uh, you know, Peter mentioned these five different things or, or facts about humans, which at least most people think are facts. Persons endure over time, persons have conscious experiences, and persons are causal agents, persons bear <coughs> responsibility, and persons are of uh, great and roughly equal worth. Uh, I would like to ask, how do you, what do you think about this? Do you yourself believe in this, and how would you sort of uh, justify them and, uh, or measure them, or how, how yeah. would you go about relating yourself self to these facts or ideas? I, I, I think I would agree with, with all of them. Uh, the, the, the first four ones, are, I think, would be within the realms of, of scientific uh, explanations, or you could study them scientifically. So you can look at how people endure over, the person endures over time. That's one of the basic uh, topics in personality psychology, the stability and change in personality and an individual 
identity and, and so on. So there's obviously a strong uh, stability. And the, the agency part is, is also something that you can demonstrate it. And so if, you, if someone has a will uh, or uh, preferences and, and wishes, they can act on those wishes and, and intentionally. And actually, this, this is, there was a sort of a funny review paper on the, on the topic because recently uh, people have been, in psychology, they've been interested in, in uh, looking at unconscious or subconscious influences on people's behavior. The, this has emerged after some some hires uh, in the 1980s or 1970s. So there have been several studies showing that, well, you can actually uh, unconscious uh, uh, stimuli can influence people's, people's behavior. And then there was this review paper on whether conscious thoughts can influence people's behavior. And I, I thought that was kind of an ingenious way of, of <laughs> looking at how, well, and the conclusion was that yes, con conscious uh, ideas can influence people's behavior. Okay, that's good that that was all also clear drop. Uh, so we are not just driven by a con uh, unconscious uh, behavior. So, so you can demonstrate that if people have conscious ideas and then feelings, yeah, they do have uh, agency. Uh, I, I guess the fifth one would, would be more kind of a question of value, how, how you value things and uh, not so much an empirical question, even though I would, I would say that uh, actually when you look at uh, evolutionary psychology uh, studies and arguments on equality, you actually see that in, in most cultures uh, people have this, it is part of the human nature to look for equality. So if someone gets more stuff to himself or herself than other people, think that he should earn, they, they will punish the person who is trying to steal more stuff to himself. So uh, there, there has to be some sort of a threat or power or possibility for, let's say, violence or something like that, that you can control people without them trying to intervene. And we've seen also these situations uh, in, in several countries within the last few years where people will start rioting against people, um, these leading leaders who take more than their share. So, so I would say that there's actually also biological uh, arguments to be made that the feeling of equality is, re uh, is to some extent wired in, in uh, human nature. And you can, there have been also studies on, on monkeys where, where the monkeys also behave in, in a way that they they look for equal uh, share of, of food. So in that sense, I, I would say that the fifth one also has some empirical uh, basis. But I would ag agree with, with all of them, yes. Yeah, you, you want to comment on then that? You're just gonna, I mean, okay. I, I think that you look culturally, the idea that all people are of equal worth. <coughs> Typically, they think of their own people as being worth more than other people who aren't themselves. They think of the people of their race, their tribe, as being of greater worth than, than, than people of other tribes. And actually, in terms of uh, 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 psychological studies, that seems to be present even in infants, that there is this, this prejudice, a tendency towards prejudice. But I think there is true that there's an empathy, and that empathy is a generalizable empathy that can go towards other people. But even when you say that for most people, suppose that for most people there's this generalized empathy, suppose you say that for 20% of the people there's not this generalized empathy. Well, do you say that 80% are right? and the 20% are wrong, or he says they said, well, I'm gonna go with the 80%. And part of the satisfaction you get of believing that you're doing what's right is believing that you're right and not the other person, right? So one of the interesting things about the studies of happiness is one of the key ingredients of happiness is a believing that what you're doing is of real meaning beyond just simply your own privileged group. In other words, you get satisfaction in believing that what you're doing is right. But you have to believe that it's right, not just simply that my group thinks it's right, or 80% thinks it's right, but I have to actually think it's right. So part of your own happiness depends on believing in an objectivity to the values that you hold on to, which are very difficult to justify from a naturalistic point of view. Yeah, so, so I would consider that the fifth one is, is I, I agree with it, but I, I wouldn't start measuring it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Going on to a question for Peter. Uh, you've argued that uh, 
the, our experience of consciousness and very basic human experiences sort of uh, fit better into a theistic framework or understanding than into a naturalistic understanding. But um, if, if we think of the specifically Christian understanding of what uh, human beings are, like uh, created the human image of God and uh, fa fallen into sin and they have this sort of uh, eternal destiny called, called towards the love of God or or, or such. Uh, so how, how would you move from this very general picture of uh, humans towards this Christian picture? Uh, yeah, what, how, how would you go, to, go about doing that? One of the dangers of my, my you know, giving this sort of philosophical argument is that people think, ah, okay, Peter is a, has embraces a god of the philosophers. It's just sort of this, this philosophical uh, mind behind the universe, sort of like a, a cosmic designer kind of <laughs> argument, but a different kind of argument. But it doesn't say that this mind has, cares at all about us. It may just simply be a mind that create a universe that would give rise to minds. But that's a far cry from what the Christian faith is about. Where it makes a difference is, uh, and, and I haven't done anything really to defend the Christian faith, but sometimes I'll give a talk on the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus and the historical case. It's actually a surprisingly strong historical case for saying that Jesus rose from the dead. But people will say, dead men don't rise. So I give a following talk entitled, But Dead Men Don't Rise! Explanation Part. So no matter how much I may not have a good explanation for it, clearly that Jesus rose from the dead, being dead, dead, isn't the right answer. There has to be some other explanations for it. So I have to go back and look at the philosophical question. And part of what drives the assumption, well, it couldn't possibly die from the, the driver, die, uh, uh, rise from the dead, is the assumption of naturalism. There is no power to overcome the physics that, that's there that, that for that to happen. There would have to be something that we know doesn't exist. So when you ask, how do you weigh evidence for the resurrection, you have to ask, what about background beliefs and what kind of background beliefs are there? If your background belief <coughs> is that really science explains everything which is real, doesn't fit in, Therefore, even though I don't have a good explanation, I'm going to dismiss it. But if you say, no, there's actually things that science doesn't account for, and our understanding of the world is quite different than that, and it may well be that the metaphysics of the world has something like mine intrinsic in it or behind it, that means that I don't have as high a bar when it comes to can I believe there's reports. And the Christian faith depends really principally on how God's acted in history, the question of historical evidence, et cetera, and also how God has acted within human experience and how, what one makes of that. But how one evaluates that is very much dependent upon the background beliefs. And the background beliefs about the nature of the world around us is really a very important belief in evaluating Christian claims. I haven't tried to defend Christian claims at all, but this, this aspect about what is the world like, if it's, if it's the case that naturalism is not obviously true, in fact, even if you stop, fall short of Thomas Nagel saying it's obviously false, or well, almost certainly false, if you say it's quite clear that there's something different, it's missing something, and we don't know it, sort of with this humility, I, I sometimes say it should engender metaphysical humility. But when we think about even the nature of the world around us, we really don't know that much about it. We're gaining more and more from a scientific standpoint, but the fact that when we deal with this, the, the mental side of it, there's something significant that we're missing. And that ought to open us up to other possibilities, and one isn't gonna be quite as resistant to, this, to the theistic solution, although clearly what I've said tonight and believing that there's mind within the universe does not give you the Christian faith. Yeah, Marcos, if I may also ask you to react to this somehow, what, how do you think uh, could these uh, old religious notions of humans as the image of God or fallen into sin or having some sort of a cosmic purpose, uh, could, if someone wanted to defend these notions, uh, now how, how would, or, or to say that they are still relevant, how should they go about doing that? And what do you think about this? Um, well, I wouldn't go on the side of, of religious arguments uh, at all, but I, my, my perspective on that topic would be that, yes, uh, some sort of, I wouldn't say perhaps spirituality, but transcendental uh, ideas are inherent in uh, human nature. So. So uh, a lot of these, let's say in personality psychology, a lot of the people who founded personality psychology in the 1950s, they put a lot of em emphasis on, on these kind of transcendental ideas that are related to human experiences and, and psychology. That's clearly a part of individual psychology that's guiding people's behavior all over the world. And uh, evolutionary uh, religious studies have, have also been 
it is one major field uh, within evolutionary psychology, looking at religion and uh, how people uh, have a lot of similar ideas across cultures in, uh, in religious beliefs. So that was probably lost in 1960s or 1970s in, in the scientific study of, of uh, human, <coughs> human behavior and, and, and personality and psychology in general. So that hasn't been given that much emphasis. But clearly, without going to the uh, factual basis of, of the religious ideas, and uh, there's clearly that it's a motivating factor for people's behavior, and, and it should be taken into account in, in the psychology of, of individual behavior. All right, thank you. Uh, right now, I think we have some about uh, 25 minutes for audience questions. Let's start here in the front. Um, so going back to your example of the back, which I found fascinating, the, the idea that there is a part of some qualitative experience that we cannot know because our brains and our neural, back, our neural front framework doesn't work the same as the bats. Um, I guess my question is that even if we're never able to directly have this qualitative experience of what it's like to be a bat, arguably the most important thing, well, one of, the, one of the more important things is the idea that if we understood all of the physics and all the chemistry and all the neuroscience of how a bat worked, we would be able to manipulate that bat's experience. Like, you could do some sort of manipulation to the bat which would change its experience. So even if our understanding doesn't ever give us that qualitative experience of what it's like to be a bat, I could say, I'm never going to have the qualitative experience of what it's like to be the speakers. <laughs> That's not something our, our, I might be able to uh, empathize and create some sort of framework of what it would be like to be this person in my own brain. But the fact of, and even going back to the pain example, even if different things are happening in different people's brains in the, uh, when they experience pain, we're still able to understand how that system works and manipulate it to help people that are experiencing pain, namely giving them drugs to help relieve the pain. So I guess, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Yeah, there's a tight connection between our mental events and neurological events. And it is true that you can affect the neurological events and then manipulate the, the conscious events. <coughs> so you could affect a, uh, influence a bat so it wouldn't have the same experiences. But the point that was being made was if there's something like to be a bat, and I couldn't have it unless I had the physiology of a bat and I could have its experiences, both its experiences and my experiences are things which aren't reducible down to the physics itself. In terms of being able to manipulate it, that was just about a week ago, there was a researcher in San Francisco who was, building, who was developing these glasses for surgeons. Uh, oops, you may have heard about this. And he discovered that it was, it was taking out certain wavelengths. He was outside, and a friend was walking with him, and he said, can I, can I try them on? So he tried them on, and it turns out his friend was colorblind. And the friend said, I can see different, different colors. And what had happened was these glasses were taking out the frequencies where the red and the green cones overlap. So this colorblindness, the red and green cones overlap, and it causes this experience of brown. And what they did was took out all the frequencies that those cones would in fact be responding to, separated the green and the red from each other, and now the person experienced green and red. Well, I think that's a wonderful thing, and it shows the connection between the neurology, the, 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 the physics, and the experience. But at the same time, it doesn't mean the experience of the green and the red was just simply the neurons firing. So that, that's, that's, the, that, that's the part that sort of is, I think should be a clue to us saying that there's something in our picture of it as just being physics. There are facts which don't reduce down to that. But didn't you just reduce them in a way, way to the, the cones being separated and therefore the person now could see the, the uh, green and the red? So no, I, I, have, I, I have to admit that I have really, my brain starts to hurt when I, I try to separate the, kind of the, the feeling part and the, kind of the, the phys physiological part. From each other, maybe. It, well, you can if you're if you're experiencing pain. Sometimes you can zap a part of the brain and get rid of the pain. Uh, that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do if you figure out where it is. In this case, it's basically not zapping, but keeping those cones from being stimulated yep. by the frequencies they respond to. 
And the result is that people can now appreciate sunset for the same time. I don't see how that's a problem for what I was saying. And any more than you can zap a, a paint, paint and yeah, cells and yeah. get rid of the pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just saying that the, 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 uh, the color blindness and, and kind of feeling that you get from seeing red or seeing green, as you, as you said, uh, that now if you can... So, so if you can manipulate it on, on this one really straightforward physiological level, then, and you can, obviously you can do it in reverse as well. You can manipulate people's feelings and you can see the result at the physiological level. And I was just wondering, from my perspective, it would be, the qu main question would be that, how do you then separate those two in, in any, let's say again, measurable way? Yeah, and then and the question for me is, is how is it, why is it the person has any experience at all, sort of what it's like to be experienced green and what it's like to experience red? And the challenge for the person who's just, just physics is either it doesn't exist, it's the phlogiston you just get rid of, or you say, well, it really is just the physical processes, and hence you have to say, well, what is the physical process? But when you do that, almost in, invariably, what's left out is what you want to explain in the first place, namely this, this feeling of it. And is that just not real? And there are some people who are so committed to naturalism that they will say, well, no, it has to be, it's not real. But most atheists actually think, no, it actually is real, and somehow we, we can't deny it, but we're going to have to say it, it's like two sides of a coin. When we look at one side of the coin, you see the mental, the other side of the coin, you mm -hmm. see the physical. And they're both real, but it's all physical. Now, okay, now explain this, give, 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 give some examples of where I can actually see the whole thing is just physical, and somehow, of course, a look at this is going to be mental. But what happens is you give a completely physical explanation and you look at the coin in all different directions and the, and the mental is not there. It's, it's, you try to explain the mental in terms of the physical, but in doing so, you've really denied that the mental as experience exists at all. So it's really, in a, not a as crude a way, but you're saying that the experiences simply don't exist. We just thought they did, the phlogiston. And if you say they do exist, like John Searle, then how, if there's some reality to them, do those, does the reality of that have any causal influence as opposed to the person that doesn't have any experiences? So you could imagine a person who doesn't have any experience of colors at all, but nonetheless is able to distinguish and separate red balls and green balls, but they don't have any experience of red and green. Okay, they don't have to have experience of red and green to actually be able to do those operations. So it doesn't seem as though the experiences are necessary for the behavioral responses. But if so, then why is it that everywhere we look in the higher orders of animals that conscious states are there? And why is it that conscious thoughts would play any role if it's not needed? But the fact that it's there makes Thomas Nagel say there must be some causal role, so it can't just simply be this, this property that mysteriously arises out of a system that's not reducible. And you go back and forth on this, but I think Thomas Nagel is right. that There is a clue to, a, a, a cue to us in this, a clue in this, that in fact naturalism is missing something very significant. And we need to take seriously what that means and have more metaphysical humility about what the world is actually like. Okay, uh, you're in the back there. Thank you for the discussion by far. Uh, in the beginning of this whole thing, Dr. Payne said there are two different views. Uh, we are our brain or we are somewhat dualistic persons. Uh, uh, I've heard about these theories about we being our bodies as a whole, not just the brain, uh, talking about wetware, and they say computers, for example, uh, cannot, can never learn to think because they don't have a body. So is there anything essentially, essentially different uh, from the notion that we are our brain in this body talk? Yeah, part of saying the brain can't function without the body, a person's arm is cut off, and it seems that most of the things the person can do, the person still does. They may still have even sensations out there. So I'm not sure there's any other part of the body you couldn't sort of piece by piece replace the mechanical systems, as long as there's blood going to the brain. In fact, just recently there's been a, a successful attempt to be able to connect the neurons to a hand, and the person by mental thoughts can actually now begin to manipulate the hand. Well, I don't see any, any, in theory, point where you could stop, where we say you couldn't replace all the body except for the brain, and say the brain wouldn't have thoughts or wouldn't be able to function. It just seems to me it has to have something. Okay, so yeah, it, it, needs, it needs some way of being able to interact with the world. Uh, 
but the fact that it has to be a physical body is not obvious to me. So when people say we are the brain, it does seem to me there's some truth in that and there's a much tighter connection between our conscious thoughts and the, the brain. Actually, it's the brain up here rather than my <laughs> spinal cord and my thoughts don't. So there's this close connection uh, and it may be that there is a deeper connection beyond just simply the brain, but I'm inclined to, inclined to lie most of the, the close connection be, to be between the mental life and the brain rather than just the mental life and the whole body. Although it's an interesting question. Have you been too narrow in saying it's just the brain that's, that's crucial in this? Um, Marcus, are, are we the brain or...? <laughs> the whole body. <laughs> uh, well, I, I would probably... I, w I would want to include the whole body, the peripheral uh, nervous system as well, because they, they obviously feed into the central nervous, nervous system, and, and uh, a lot of the, let's say, biological markers that you can measure, uh, you measure them that are related to people's behavior and, and personality and intelligence. You can measure those also from the peripheral nervous system. So, so that's obviously a, a, an important part of, uh, of human behavior. But if I'd have to, well, I would go with the, the, the whole body. Okay. <laughs> sort of be, just to be inclusive. All right. All right. <laughs> because I, I think you do exclude a lot of things if you just go with the, with the brain. But, yeah. Question to Yoga. Um, if you have a lamp and, and um, light, and if a uh, lamp uh, goes broken and you don't have light anymore, does that mean that those two things are equal? They are the same thing? The lamp and the light? Yeah. Let's see. I think this is a trick, trick question. I sense it. <laughs> <laughs> No problem, they are not. Yeah. Well, do you think this also apply, could be applied to the problem of uh, you know, brain and consciousness? Uh, they could be separate even if, if uh, affecting the brain affects the consciousness. Well, yeah, it might. Uh, but I, I tend to think that, uh, as, a, as my example of traffic jams, and uh, we could pick some other uh, analogies of of what sort of what do we compare things to when we are talking about self awareness or consciousness? I, I I think the you have to be really careful about what sort of analogy you you take uh, to compare consciousness and and conscious feelings because uh, they are always limited and. Psychology has a long history of, of, well, first the mind was a, a steam engine because we had steam engines, and then the mind was a, a computer because we had computers, and then the mind was... Now, nowadays it's probably something like internet. That seems to... Start, the mind is like an internet, and, and now probably the mind is like Facebook, and you never know what it's, what it's going to be next. So, so I think you have to be always really careful about uh, comparing those uh, because those may, may mislead you quite uh, easily. All right, uh, in the middle of the... Yes, you. Yes, thank you for a great debate. Uh, I was going to ask Marcus, and uh, excuse me, this is a simple-minded question. But... No, I like those ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, you were affirming free agency quite strongly in your opening speech. I was wondering, like, could you briefly explain like, how does free agency arise, and how would you measure it if, it's, if a decision is uh, limited by circumstances, or if it is in fact a free choice. So just like your view on that. Well, roughly, I, I would roughly suggest that, well, first of all, I can obviously, you can, you can demonstrate the, the free agency by, by the fact that now if I decide that I will walk there, I could go there. That's free agency. But when you look at human behavior on kind of scientific studies of human behavior, or how people behave in their everyday life, on average and in general, a lot of those behaviors can be predicted and people have habits and people have cognitive biases and they usually, a lot of the, their behavior is based on those cognitive biases or kind of automatic responses or their personality tendencies or uh, cognitive, some uh, kind of biased processing of information and, uh, and so on and social norms, obviously, as well. So if it was the case, uh, this is how I 
I think about it, is, is that if it was the case that you, you would only focus on the free agency part, then it would be, be really difficult to predict people's behavior in any way, because you would kind of assume that, well, everyone's going to behave based on their free agency and they make decisions completely freely, because they can reflect on themselves. And obviously, we can do that. It's just the sort of basic ob observation of human sciences is that most people, on most cases, don't. So we, we can, if, if it, uh, so we, we could, every, every person could be much better. They could exercise more and eat healthy and uh, behave always rationally and, and plan ahead and, and so on. But a lot of times, People don't do those things, and that's related to. Kind of, that's why I, I would say that the, the free agency idea is you should think about it in degrees. So obviously we do have when we exert, uh, we we use sort of willpower o on it, we we can do all those things. But a lot of a lot of the times we are not guided <laughs> by the free agency part, but we are guided by by habits and uh, biases and and so on. Let me just insert. Bertrand Russell has a quote, I don't know where he said it, but I've heard it often enough, I think he actually said it. He says, I can do as I will, but I cannot will as I will. So if I choose to walk over there, I can do that, I can do as I will, but was the choice to walk over there something which I chose? Can I choose my choice? Can I will as I will? And if I can't even partially will as I will, then the question is, what's left with free agency at all? Did, did you have a follow-up on, on? If I may. Well, have a very briefly, please. So, yes, thank you. I was going to ask about that. How would you prove that the choice to walk is a choice of fact and not to decide that? To, pr to prove that? Yeah. Well, I, I know that there are there's, there's these, uh, again, studies that hurts your brain when you start thinking about it, that actually you can measure brain activity already before the intention to do something, like press a button. And uh, so, so, yes, I, I, that would take the degree of freedom, freedom of choice or agency, that would reduce it drastically. Uh, so so I, I would be happy to admit that my decision to walk there, which was actually influenced by you just a minute ago, it was not my decision to do that because you kind of made me to prove my, my free agency and again, it wasn't a free, free choice in that sense. So, so I, would, I would be completely happy to admit that you actually can reduce the free agency part uh, to uh, uh, a uh, fewer amount uh, than, than I suggested. Yes. Let me just say something real quick. The, that experiment, the kind of experiment we're talking about, when the person presses the button, the, the chain of events leading up to pressing the button, and they know that when this chain of events start, the person will press the button. That chain of events starts before the person is conscious of deciding to press the button. So does that mean that the person really had no control, but rather the choice to press the button was determined by the prior states of the brain? The assumption that's made there is the person is only <coughs> conscious. And it seems to me the idea that if the self exists at all, the self is only conscious would be a very strange thing. It means I would never know what I'm going to do until I actually say it. But it seems in most instances we actually do have a sense of what we're going to do even before it comes into our conscious awareness. If you're working on a math problem, you, oh, in fact, you realize you're coming with a solution even before you're aware of it. And when you're deliberating something, if the deliberation is below the level of consciousness, if you have no control over that, then that's, that's a very odd sense of self. If the only time you ever have any control is after you've already, that comes into consciousness, then that isn't, that, it doesn't seem to me that's a very, uh, the idea of self, to take it seriously, it's going to always have a subconscious part of it as well as a conscious part of it. And to have it be the only conscious part of it, that means I really can no, have no clue as to what I think until I see myself doing something or until something pops into my consciousness or deliberation is never me. So I think the assumption is that the self, if the self has any influence, it has to be only the conscious level. But if in fact the self has a subconscious as well as a conscious part, I think every decision we have will have subconscious components that come before the conscious part, but that doesn't mean that I have no control over it. So that's a fundamental question in terms of how you interpret those kinds of studies. So, so just briefly, so you would suggest that we have control on the 
subconscious part as well. I think there's some control we have on the subconscious. I suspect if we didn't have any conscious events at all, we probably wouldn't have any control. But to think that I can only control what's going on in my conscious event means that I can't have any control of my deliberation. As you're probably yeah, yeah. thinking about it, clearly there are not lots of conscious thoughts going through, through your brain, but you are thinking about it, and yeah. you know you're thinking about it. And so that tells us that actually there's, the self is very much involved in things which are below the level of consciousness. And to think that somehow uh, that experiment shows that there's no free will assumes <laughs> that the self is only can have causal effect if it's above the level of consciousness. But it's an interesting question, but it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't settle the question of whether or not there's free will. Uh, those are called Libet experiments, uh, so you can look it up online. There's a lot of discussion, really. I think usually the uh, critique that a lot of people make is, uh, is that all, all of this simple experiment takes place in a in the wider context of uh, agency. You know, the people choose to participate in this study, and, they discuss beforehand what they're going to do, so it's it, it's kind of a little bit silly even to just take the one example, like now you push the button and so you don't have any, any agency, where the whole, uh, whole uh, experiment is infused and takes place in the context of agency, but that's a really big discussion, maybe we can go back to that later, but you now for one the last question, I think up there in the corner. You have uh, yeah, thank you for discussion so, so far, I have a question for Dr. Payne about thermostats, I guess. This might be a bit silly, but, but bear with me. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but your main argument has been that uh, our behaviors can be limited or influenced by physical facts such as the brain and the body. But qualia or the actual conscious experiences are trickier and are not necessarily bound to the physical world, but rather some sort of mind behind the universe. No, no, I actually, I'm, I'm glad you said that, because if, if that's how you heard it, that's not what I was saying. I think right. our qualia, the experiences, actually are bound, right. in the case of human beings, to activities in our brains. As that, that doesn't mean that other beings couldn't, but even sort of the question of, uh, of when I die, <laughs> will I ever have disembodied experiences? And Christians will differ about that. Some of them say well, there will be disembodied experiences, and then I'll get a, a, a body where I didn't have any body at all. But if, in fact, uh, my experiences now depend upon a body that I have, and a person destroys part of my brain, they can destroy part, I mean, they keep me from having certain experiences or cause me to have experiences that I wouldn't have otherwise. So my assumption is the first thoughts I'll have to after I die, I mean, I'm a Christian, I believe there's life after death, will be embodied thoughts. And at that point, my thoughts will still be dependent upon the body that God has given to me. <laughs> My original question was that you, you seem to have this intuition that uh, stones or thermostats cannot have conscious experiences, and I was just wondering if the conscious experiences are not necessarily bound to any physical vessel, then why wouldn't something that we don't usually think of as conscious be conscious? Yeah, and I, I think that for us and for animals, their experiences are bound to their bodies, their brains. Uh, and I presume that the thermostat and the rock uh, it, is, it is, does not have whatever it, whatever it is that causes us to have it. I mean, some people say there's actually something, there's, there, there's a, I'm quite open to the dualist view. Actually, my, I'm, I'm a minimal dualist. I think there really is something substantial, which is me, which survives death. But at the same time, I don't think that the me in operations is able to do anything apart from the function of my brain, and hence there's this, there's this tight overlay with which all of my thoughts, in fact, are based on physical operations and when a stone doesn't have anything that would, would be a physical basis for thoughts, there's no operations there which I could interpret as being, well, that's a thought of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a oh, whatever a thought. <laughs> I just can't see how I can interpret the physical, what's going on in the brain as having the kind of structure that could support, or even a thermostat, that would have a thought about that it's, now, if, if people say that the thoughts are just the behavior, well, you just have a simple form of behavior. Uh, so it is a very simple form of thought. Uh, and maybe you would think that actually is a very simple form of thought if you think with Alan Turing that thought really is just behavior. But I think, at least from where I'm coming from, that seems quite problematic, and there are lots of atheists who also think that's quite problematic. All right, so just to clarify, do you think that after death there might be a body? I think, the thought, I think, I think believing in life after death, as I, as I do as a Christian, yes. I think the first thoughts that I have after this life will it be embodied thoughts. It may not be my final body, 
But I don't think the first thoughts we'll have will be, you know, there's nothing here, <laughs> but I'm having thoughts, I'm having visual experiences, but there's no eye or anything. I mean, that, that's not impossible, I suppose. Uh, but at the same time, given that I, I think that we will still be finite creatures and still have those kinds of dependencies uh, even, after, even after this life. But that's, again, Christians will, will differ on that kind of topic. All right, the, on these thoughts, I think it's uh, appropriate to bring our evening to a close. And, and now, please uh, don't leave quite wet yet, because our Veritas Forum coordinator has something to say. But first, let's thank the speakers and do all the